Today we're going to talk about <clears throat> probably the biggest, most serious viral outbreak in many years, uh, AIDS and HIV-1. I want to start with a quote from this book, and it goes, this tragedy was facilitated or even caused by human interventions, colonization, urbanization, and probably well-intentioned public health campaigns. This is from The Origin of AIDS by Jacques Pepin. I highly recommend it. Pepin is a doctor who worked in Africa, so he knows the kinds of conditions that are present in many countries there. And I'm gonna, what I hope to do today is give you some evidence that what he's suggesting is true, that uh, this epidemic or pandemic was brought on in part by things that people do. <clears throat> the AIDS pandemic began uh, in 1981, June of 81, Morbidity Mortality Weekly Report published this little report, Pneumocystis Pneumonia Los Angeles, five young men, all active homosexuals, were treated for biopsy-confirmed pneumocystis carinae pneumonia at three different hospitals in LA. Two of the patients died. All five had lab-confirmed uh, cytomegalovirus and candidal mucosal infection. So this was the first case report of a couple of cases where they all look very similar and it was unusual. Pneumocystis pneumonia in the U.S. is almost exclusively limited to severely immunosuppressed patients, so people on organ transplant suppressive drugs, for example. And these were otherwise healthy men, so this was unusual. So they concluded all the observations suggest the possibility of a cellular immune dysfunction related to a common exposure that predisposes individuals to opportunistic infections. So this was puzzling at the time, but um, eventually with uh, vigilance and looking for these symptoms, clusters of uh, pneumocystis carinae pneumonia, again, unusual in healthy people, and Kaposi sarcoma, a, a cancer, were observed together at various cities in the U.S. Eventually, the CDC established a case definition, which was very simple, Kaposi sarcoma or opportunistic infections. These are so rare up to this point that they could be used to track down what was going on uh, in these individuals. By 1982, the disease was called AIDS. In the mean, meantime, it had been called GRID, gay-related immunodeficiency, but quickly was found to infect not just homosexuals, but many other people as well, uh, and was found to be transmitted at birth and heterosexually. So the causative agent is HIV, which is a lentivirus in the retrovirus family. It was isolated in 1983 from the lymph node of a patient with swollen lymph nodes in Paris, and this individual had HIV infection. A blood test was developed in 1984, so as soon as you have the virus, you could start screening blood with it. Uh, and by EM, you could see that this was a lentivirus, a known group of retroviruses. So up at this point, this virus is spreading like crazy in blood products, for example. Uh, and even though we detected it here in, in 84, it's still many, many more years of uh, infections went on because the blood hadn't been checked for many years. So the retrovirus family, we've touched on quite a bit uh, in this course. Um, we have talked about um, beta and gamma retroviruses um, that in terms of Rouse sarcoma virus, for example. Uh, here is lentiviruses. It's a genus within the retrovirus family com composed of two different HIVs, HIV 1 and 2. Uh, and then there's another genus within the retrovirus family, delta retroviruses, which can contain the human T lymphotropic viruses, the other retroviruses that infect people, which we won't be talking about today. So the lymphotropic viruses, HTLV1, 3, and 4, uh, and the HIVs, 1 and 2, are the two human retroviruses, the two groups are the genera of human retroviruses. Uh, these aren't new viruses. In fact, we have known before HIV was discovered lots of immunosuppressive viruses in other animals. So for example, in equine infectious anemia virus causes an immunodeficiency of horses isolated in the early 1900s. So there are quite a few viruses that infect different species, feline immunodeficiency virus, etc. The virus uh, should look familiar to you. It's an envelope virus with glycoproteins in the envelope. Inside is a capsid 
containing the viral RNA, which is plus stranded. There are two copies of it, and it's complex with a variety of proteins, including the integrase and the reverse transcriptase. Uh, HIV and the lentiviruses are what we call retroviruses with complex genomes. They encode a lot of proteins, as opposed to the um, Rouse sarcoma and murine leukemia viruses that we've talked about, which have gag, pol, and envelope. These viruses have gag, pol, and envelope, but they also encode a lot of other proteins with various names, VIF, VPR, uh, REV, etc. And they all have very different functions. They're all produced by alternative splicing, you can see here, from the genomic RNA. These are, of course, produced from the proviral DNA, which is integrated into the host cell. So this is very much like any other retrovirus in the sense of the life cycle and reverse transcription and integration. They just make many more proteins. So uh, the disease was called AIDS after a few years, acquired immunodeficiency syndrome. And a syndrome, of course, is when you have a group of symptoms or patterns that always go together. So in this case, it was immunosuppression, uh, Kaposi sarcoma, opportunistic infections, and that's the syndrome. And usually you make a syndrome when you're not quite sure what's causing it. In the beginning, we didn't know what was causing this, so it was called a, a syndrome. Uh, and HIV causes AIDS. There's no doubt about it. There are lots of AIDS denialists out there. I get emails from them every week telling me that it's never been proven that HIV causes AIDS. I hope you never waste a moment of your life thinking about this because there's no doubt that this virus causes AIDS. And it's, it's been proven by people in hospitals who get needle sticks with contaminated needles from a patient with the disease and they get infected. People have been given um, blood that's been infected and it transmits the disease and so forth. There's simply no question about it. Uh, like the vaccine denialists, I simply do not understand what these individuals are trying to accomplish. Uh, this, I want to give, spend just a few minutes talking about the numbers here because these are quite big for this virus infection. In the U.S., uh, HIV has killed over 600,000 people, which is more than all the combat-related uh, deaths in, in the 20th century. At the moment, over 1.2 million people are infected. 14% don't know it. They haven't developed disease yet. Every year there are 50,000 new infections in the U.S., 70% in men and 30% in women, and half of these infections occur in young people, 25 years of age and younger. <clears throat> this is a global summary of the epidemic as of 2013. It, we're always a few years behind in collecting the data, but this is collected by WHO and UNICEF. But you can see the number of people uh, living with AIDS at the moment, 35 million, and there's the breakdown, adults, women, and children. Newly infected people uh, in 2013, 2 million. This is global numbers now. Uh, AIDS deaths globally in 2013, one and a half million. adults and children living with the disease by country. I want you to see the breakdown because it is so skewed to sub-Saharan Africa. 24.7 million people. I have 35 million total in just sub-Saharan Africa alone. And right, at, right away, that should tell you something about where uh, this virus came from. Now, there are many in other countries as well, but sub-Saharan Africa gets uh, the main burden. Number of adults and children newly infected in 2013. Again, Sub-Saharan Africa, 1.5 million is more than any, anyone else. There are many people elsewhere, of course, who are getting infected, but there are big differences in the numbers. Deaths in 2013, again, Sub-Saharan Africa, 1.1 million. Um, a lot in uh, Asia and the Pacific, North America and Western and Central Europe, not so many. Children, less than 15 years of age, living with uh, HIV, Again, sub-Saharan Africa, almost 3 million people. And m many of these are infected at birth. They don't have any say in whether they get the disease or not. Number of children newly infected, uh, 2013. Again, 200,000 newly infected kids less than 15 years of age in sub-Saharan Africa. Very different from uh, other parts of the world, as you can see. So in the US, for example, we control infection at birth very well now. <clears throat> Estimated deaths in children, 180,000 in 
sub-Saharan Africa. And that is out of 190,000 total globally. So most of the child deaths are occurring uh, in sub-Saharan Africa. 6,000 new infections a day in 2013. It's probably very similar right now. 68% in sub-Saharan Africa, 700 in kids, and 5,200 in adults, 47% uh, women, 33% among young people. So this is really targeting a very specific part of the world, and in particular, it's very sad to see young kids infected because they're the future, of course. This is the course of new infections and deaths from 1990 to 2011. Uh, the infections peaked in about 1997, uh, and then we began to understand how to prevent infection. We could treat it as well. The deaths uh, are lagging behind because the disease takes a long time uh, to lead to death. Uh, but this trend is almost st holding steady at the moment. Now, a few weeks ago, we talked about how triple antiviral therapy can take a person with infection, with virus, and have them lead a normal life, or at least as normal as possible, without dying. Triple drug therapy. But this is in countries with money. And it's only now that we're beginning to push this drug into other areas where they can't afford it. We pay for it. Charitable organizations pay for it and distribute it. So here's the distribution of antiretroviral therapy in low and middle income countries. Uh, so just for comparison, the blue curve uh, is in high income countries. So obviously they get a lot of drug because they can afford it. And this is going up hugely because this is the way to take care of all those 35 million infections. You can see we're not quite at everyone. Uh, but then if you look at the African region in yellow, we're not doing so badly. So the goal here is to really push uh, these antiretrovirals because there's no reason to die from this infection because these antiretrovirals will save your life. Uh, this is another way to look at people in low-income countries, low- and middle-income countries. Uh, in 2010, 15.9 uh, million people were eligible for antiretroviral therapy, but only about 10 million of them uh, were actually getting it. In 2013, about 28.6 million people are eligible. And again, only 10 million people getting it. So we haven't really, we've increased the number of people who should be getting them, but we're not really doing a great job at getting it to them. A lot of that money to pay for those are donated by WHO, Rotary International, the Gates Foundation, and many other foundations and so forth. And this is a really good thing to do. So we have these drugs. If we get them to everyone, we can keep them from dying, but we can't cure the infection. Once a person's infected, that, that proviral DNA is in their DNA, and it's in very long-lived cells that <clears throat> we can't get rid of. There's no vaccine, so we can't stop new infections from occurring. Uh, you cannot sta stop taking your antiretrovirals. If you do, you immediately have virus returning, uh, and you have to go back on them again. The, the virus, as I said, lives in a very long-lived cell, maybe a hematopoietic progenitor cell in the bone marrow that gives rise to all the immune cells. The viral DNA is in there. These cells live for a long time. Uh, the virus is not produced from those cells. Every time they divide, which is rarely, the DNA is passed on. You can't get rid of it. You cannot go in and kill those cells specifically. If you do stop taking drugs, you get drug-resistant viruses appearing. The drugs, as I said, uh, are very expensive. And as you can probably tell from those graphs and, and maps I showed you, the disease is becoming a third world disease. It wasn't always that case, but the way it's grown over the past years is growing because of the discrepancy in treatment, and that really shouldn't be. <clears throat> so let's talk a little bit about where this virus came from. I just showed you we first detected it in 1981, but when did it actually infect people? It looks like it, it came out of Africa, and I'm going to give you some evidence for this. Uh, the first uh, studies after the virus was discovered and a blood test was made, then all over the world people started saying, who has this virus? Who's infected? They did blood tests initially um, looking for viral proteins and then by PCR when PCR was developed. And the first studies that were of this sort, these epidemiological studies that were done in Africa, and they were done in Zaire and Rwanda, so here's Zaire, uh, or DR Congo, Rwanda, here, showed that um, 
a HIV was very common in the capitals of those countries. 90% of sex workers were positive for the virus. So again, this was not even known before we started looking. We had no clue that so many people were infected, and in particular in these areas, a lot of, them, a lot of the sex workers were infected. A lot of archival samples were available from these countries to go back in the freezer and ask, is there virus in some old samples? And um, some samples were tested, uh, and they, they showed that uh, the virus was probably around in the 60s and 70s in Central Africa, but not in the West or in the East. And in particular, this first one here, ZR59, ZR, ZR standing for Zaire, um, uh, it was from an adult male from 1959, was positive for HIV-1 in 1998. Now this male didn't know he had AIDS at the time, but he probably died of it. And that was positive. We, we were able to get that sample and, and show by PCR that it was positive. And then a second sample that was telling a lymph node biopsy from a woman, also from DRC, uh, in 1960, a year later, also shown to be positive for virus. So 1959 and 1960, clearly the virus was already around 20 years before uh, we detected it in 1981. Those two samples, uh, nucleotide sequences of the viral genome, were obtained. Those differed by 12%. So that's a lot. So that means this virus was diversifying already in 1959 and 1960. So there's no doubt that it was present uh, in, in Leopoldville, which is Kinshasa today, uh, the capital of DRC, or Zaire. By 1959-60, the virus was clearly uh, extensively spreading. Now, before we go further in talking about the origins, I want to talk a little bit about HIV diversity. This is quite unusual. So HIV-1, there are two kinds of uh, HIV. We'll talk about two later. HIV-1 occurs in four groups. Group M, group N, group O, and group P, okay? Four groups based on sequence alignments. Group M, M stands for main because 99% of infections in the world are caused by group M viruses. The group O stands for outlier. There's only less than 1% of infections, and these are limited to Cameroon, uh, Gabon, and neighboring countries. Group N, there are 13 cases that we know of. And group P, there are two cases, and both of those are in Cameroon. Each of these groups originated from an independent transmission of simian immunodeficiency virus from a monkey to humans. We'll talk about that in a moment. So four separate introductions, and only one of them really took off, group M. That's the one that's infecting most of people globally. The other one's very small numbers and geographically very limited. So these viruses didn't quite make it. Group M is the one that make it. So here's HIV-1. Uh, there are four groups. HIV-2 is, is over there by itself. Uh, and then Group M further diversified into nine subtypes, shown below here, uh, A through K, and then CRFs. So CRFs stand for circulating recombinant forms. Uh, individuals who are at high risk for multiple infections, like sex workers, they're infected many, many times a year. They get multiple strains. These viruses recombine in them. And then the most fit ones spread to other people. And those are what circulating recombinant forms are. So in a, in a situation where you can allow recombination, the most fit viruses will take off and infect other people. So that's what CRFs, there are 48 different CRFs that we've discovered so far. All these other subtypes <clears throat> simply represent diversification of the virus in new populations. We don't really see any major biological or patho pathological differences between these subtypes, A through CRFs. Uh, there, there are a few, for example, those infected with D, subtype D, tend to die a little quicker. Uh, shedding of subtype C in the female genital tract is higher, so that may uh, account for its higher transmission. And as you'll see in a moment, C predominates in uh, Central Africa. But as far as we can tell, these simply represent, remember, you have to imagine that there's no HIV in the world, and all of a sudden, 
viruses are being seeded everywhere by travel and so forth. And when they're seeded in a new place, they diversify. And that, that's because this virus uh, evolves very quickly, like RNA viruses. And so you get all these different subtypes evolving. So if you, when you get infected with HIV, you typically get one virus particle. You get one genome. And then it diversifies incredibly in you. Remember the RTs or RNA polymerases, they make a lot of errors, one in 10 to the 4, 10 to the 5, once per genome per replication cycle. So this helps us to reconstruct infection patterns, right? So you can tell in a country uh, which subtype came from where and who it's infecting and so forth. And this has been made possible by sequencing, which really became facile in the 1990s. We were able to sequence lots of samples quickly and at great depth. And all of these studies, which were done, showed the extreme diversity of the virus in Central Africa. Obviously, it had been there more than anywhere else. It was more diverse there than in any other country. So again, the virus is seeding everywhere throughout the country, uh, diversifying into subtypes long before it traveled to other countries. So the greatest diversity in Africa compared to other countries really is a main reason why uh, we initially thought it originated in that country. And of course, I'll show you in a moment the proof that it, in fact, originated there. Now, this kind of uh, reconstruction can be used for forensic purposes. So there are some individuals who are infected with AIDS and then have unprotected sex with other people. And they spread infection to them, and the, these other individuals uh, then sue the person. And in court, you can get the viral sequences from the original person and the people that he or she infected, and you can actually prove uh, the source of the infection because of the way the virus evolves. And this has been done very famously in a, in a number of initial trials and now can be done routinely. Some subtypes are associated with locations and modes of transmission. But you can imagine that a, a single virus introduced into a specific population will then diversify in a specific way. This is called a founder effect. The subtype predominates in an at-risk group. And here's an example. Uh, subtype B is found in 96% of white homosexuals in South Africa. It was imported from the US. So again, uh, someone came from the US went into a similar population in South Africa. So that subtype predominates in a similar population in South Africa. Subtype C accounts for 81% of, in of infections of black heterosexuals in, South Af in Central Africa as well. So uh, how the viruses originally get into a population and that, that population tends to stay within itself and spread the viruses within themselves really can be tracked by looking at these subtypes. So here's a global map of the distribution of the subtypes. Here's a key on the left, which shows you all the subtypes A through K, and then the circulating recombinant forms, and they are color-coded. You can see globally uh, the pie chart on the right, 48% of all the isolates are C, subtype C, 50% or so. Uh, and in Africa, central, uh, southern Africa right here, uh, we have mostly C. Central Africa is a mix of many different subtypes, and again, probably because this is where it originated. Uh, you can see here in the U.S., um, the, the A or B, B subtype predominates. So again, this reflects the fact that all of these subtypes diversified in Africa, then they spread to other countries. The first one to arrive in the U.S. was a, uh, a B serotype, a, a B subtype, and that expanded and predominated. Okay. But again, this is of epidemiological consequence. It doesn't really influence the pathogenesis. This is just a way for us to be able to track uh, how the virus has spread with time. OK, back to the origin. After HIV was identified in people, then people started looking at other animals and asking, is there, are there related viruses in other animals. And, and uh, one of the kinds of animal that was looked at was the monkey, especially in Africa, because there was a lot of evidence that the virus might have originated there. And in 1989, uh, simian immunodeficiency virus, highly related to HIV, was isolated from a chimpanzee in 1989. It's called SIV-CPZ for a chimpanzee. 
And this uh, virologist here, Beatrice Hahn, from the University of Pennsylvania, she headed an effort to collect uh, fecal samples from chimpanzees here and later on from gorillas from 90 different field sites in Africa and to figure out uh, do these chimps have the virus and which one is the most related to HIV. And so she is shown there in my lab in front of the wall of polio before it fell. And um, just parenthetically, her daughter took this course, I think three years ago, and I didn't know it at the time, but uh, the next year she asked to be a TA and she was a TA for the course and now she's a, a medical student uh, at Columbia. So this is a very famous virologist. I mean, she is the one who figured out the origin of HIV, so I think this is really cool. Now, there aren't many chimpanzees globally. I think there are between a million and a million and a half, and they're all, the wild ones anyway, are all here in Central Africa. And each of these little circles is a different uh, colony of chimps. They tend to stay to themselves. They don't mix. If there's a river, they don't cross it because they don't swim. So these are very isolated animals, and uh, there are different species. You can see Pan troglodytes is the, uh, the species, and then there are subspecies like P.T. varus, L.E.O.T., P.T. troglodytes, uh, P.T. schweinfurthi, and then P. Uh, paniscus, the bonobo. All right, and these guys are scattered in, in, in independent places throughout Central Africa. What uh, Beatrice did with her workers, she, she calls her workers an army of shit collectors. <laughs> they go out into the woods and they collect chimpanzee feces and they look, first they do mitochondrial DNA typing to make sure it's a chimpanzee. I guess you can't tell by looking at it. And then they look for HIV, which turns out to be in feces, which is great because you can't catch these guys, you never see them, and if you did, um, people wouldn't want you bleeding them, all right? So the fact that it was in feces, she found out early on, and this was great. And so she collected over 7,000 fecal samples from 90 different field sites, some of these had no SIV in them. Some of them had SIV, but it wasn't very related to HIV. Only one species, uh, two species have uh, SIV CPZ, Pan troglodytes troglodytes and Pan troglodytes schweinfurthi. Uh, and these are color coded here. Those are the yellow ones. All the white circles are other colonies of chimps which have no uh, SIV in them. Now, um, so this virus, by the way, is transmitted among chimps very much like um, it's, it is among humans by sexual intercourse. Uh, it's also passed at birth from mother to child, not across the placenta, but at birth when there's lots of blood present, the baby gets infected with virus in the mother's blood. And these animals do fight and probably that also contributes to spreading as well. And chimpanzees, the estimated transmission probability per coital act is 0.008 to 0.0015, which is similar to the uh, probability in humans. And finally, this virus kills chimpanzees. All right, it causes an immunodeficiency, and eventually the chimpanzees die. And a lot of chimps have been uh, dying because of this infection, uh, of those two species, that is. So uh, what... what um, Beatrice found was that two of the HIV groups, M and N, uh, originated from pan troglodytes and not Schweinfurthi, the other uh, chimpanzee species that harbors SIV. All right, so at some point there was a cross-species infection from these chimps uh, to humans, and that's the origin of M and N. The men, again, they're two separate uh, cross-species infections from chimps to human, one for M, uh, and one for N. <clears throat> Chimp, now, and chimps did not always have this virus. They got it from something else. And where they got it from is um, old world monkeys, which are shown here. All these guys, the Mona, red cap mangabe, mandrills, and all this. These are old world monkeys that live in Africa. Each of them has their own flavor of SIV. You can see it in this central diagram. So the Mona monkey has the SIV Mona, etc. These old world monkeys are okay with infection. They don't get sick. 
They're persistently infected for their lifetime and they are fine. They have apparently been evolving with this virus for millions of years and they have developed uh, host countering mechanisms that allow them to survive, yet they make virus. At some point, uh, the, a chimp got infected, PTT got infected, and we think it, this uh, chimpanzee, the original one, got virus that was a recombinant uh, between two uh, SIVs from Mona monkey and the red cap mangabe. Whether it was co-infected or got infected with a recombinant, we don't know. So the chimp that passed the virus on to humans was originally infected uh, by a monkey SIV. How it acquired it, we don't know. Probably the chimps eat monkeys from time to time. You know, we think that they are nice uh, vegetarians, but in fact, they will eat meat, they fight, they hunt, and they probably got infected that way. All right, so that's the origin of HIV M and M. So it came from PTT, not PTS. Schweinfurti was the other SIV positive chimp colony that Beatrice Hahn found, but that virus is not the one that jumped over. We can tell by looking at the sequence, and I'll show you that in a minute. The HIV P and O uh, groups, these aren't very many infections with these, right? Less than uh, 20 or 30. These came from gorillas to humans. And that's just been shown recently again by Beatrice Hahn and her colleagues by collecting a lot of gorilla shit in the forest. Um, the gorillas, in turn, got it from a chimp at some point. So we don't know how because we don't, we don't see gorillas and chimps interacting, but the implication is at some point they fought or, or a gorilla ate a chimp or so forth. But anyway, it's quite clear that uh, the gorilla virus came from PTT some time, some time ago. Not too long ago, not eons ago, but maybe hundreds of years ago. So that's the origin of HIV. SIV from chimps or gorillas, which in turn came from uh, these old world monkeys, which inhabit all of Africa. All right. So before we go on, I've been showing you in this course lots of phylogenetic trees. Maybe you don't know what they mean or how to read them. So here's a primer on phylogenetic trees. So basically, this measures genetic distances between organisms, can be viruses, bacteria, people, monkeys, whatever, and it can identify nearest relatives. Uh, so you put these sequences in the form of a tree where the common ancestor is on the left. And often you don't have the ancestor of whatever you're looking at today, but you infer it by re sequence relationships. Um, so the root is at the extreme left, that's assumed to be the common ancestor, and as you move right in the tree, this is a temporal movement, you're assuming evolution in time from left to right, and you're watching the sequences change. So the way you make these is simply by comparing sequences of many isolates, there are computer programs that assemble the trees, uh, and you can do this for a single gene of a virus, and typically what's done is to do it with many independent genes and just make sure that the conclusions are the same. All right, so that's a phylogenetic tree. And here are three trees using the GAG, the Paul, and the envelope genes of SIV and HIV just to show you how this is done. Let's just look at the, the polymerase because the conclusions are mainly the same. Uh, this happened to come from the gorilla paper, which is why the gorilla sequences are highlighted. But what we have here, HIV M group sequences and HIV N, and you can see they cluster very closely with the SIV from PTT, SIV CPT from PTT. They're all, they all have common ancestors that are close to them. This common ancestor is, is the origin of everyone, of course, but it's, but it's much more distant. So the, the clustering of uh, SIV CPZ with M shows you that they have a common ancestor. In the same way, N has a common ancestor in PTT, but that is distinct from the uh, M ancestor. That's why they're two different introductions. You can see um, the gorilla virus clusters with the P group HIV, one, and the other gorilla virus uh, clusters with the O group. <clears throat> Schwein, uh, Schweinfurthy, the other uh, pan troglodytes down here in orange or brown, is a very different virus. And you can see it's not related. It's not clustering on the same branch of this tree with M or N or P or O. That's why we ruled out Schweinfurthy as the source of HIV in people. It's clearly uh, either CPZ, PTT, or, or gorillas. And this is consistent among uh, all of these different proteins. 
So you can do this analysis with protein sequence or you can do it with genome sequence and hopefully it, it all agrees. Of course, if you do a whole genome, you can get funny results if there's a recombinant. So that's why you like to do it with individual proteins which presumably have moved, moved around modularly. So this virus came from a chimp or a gorilla into people. And the M group, of course, is the one that has caused most infections. So let's talk a little bit about how that might have worked. So remember, at the beginning of the 1900s, Africa had not yet been colonized by Europe. It was just people who were born and raised there, living in small villages. There weren't a lot of big towns. Leopoldville was the, was the most uh, dynamic and, and large city in the region. And this is a graph showing you the population growth uh, with time. So here we're starting in 1880, and these cities on here are uh, some of the uh, centers, the capital centers of Africa. And you can see that starting at the beginning of the 1900s, you have a very big population growth, 1910, 20, 30, 40, uh, 50, and 60. And this population growth was stimulated in part by European colonization of Africa. And what we think is that a hunter was out in the forest hunting what we call bushmeat, could be hunting chimps or, or gorillas or maybe just finding dead animals uh, on the floor of the forest. Uh, and he or she, we don't know who it was, might have cut themselves while butchering the meat and gotten infected. And the idea is they may have visited a brothel eventually and spread the virus to others. And then perhaps after visiting the brothel sometime later, going to a sexually transmitted disease clinic to get treatment where they might have given this individual injections using unsterilized needles, which would have passed the virus on to other individuals as well. So from that single hunter, uh, and there are lots of numbers, if you read that book, The Origin of AIDS, you will see that we, uh, probably there was only one. Uh, that virus was amplified by non-sterile syringes, sex. Some women, some prostitutes in this region had 1,000 clients a year, so if one of them were infected by this original cut hunter, they could spread it to 1,000 people and so forth. Uh, and this is how the virus amplified. Now, um, the Belgian Congo was um, originally colonized by Belgium. So these are, remember, these are originally independent nations. Europe felt they had the right to go in and take over and, and take whatever resources were there. So the Congo was taken over by Belgium. By 1960, the, the, the Congolans had enough of this and they kicked the Belgians out. Um, but then they realized they didn't have any doctors because most of the doctors in the country were Belgians. So Haitians volunteered to come and be their doctors. They spoke the same language. And guess what happens? The Haitians got infected and went back to Haiti eventually, and that's what brought in part the virus uh, to the Western Hemisphere. So lots of very interesting um, conflagrations of, of things happening, all circling around this European colonization uh, of Africa. So as I said, there are four separate crossover events. We can date MNO to the first three decades of the 20th century. Uh, NNP are more recent, but we're not quite sure. We don't have enough data. And Kinshasa was the epicenter. And the spread of the infection correlated with the development of these colonial cities. Again, Europeans came into Africa. They said, we want to build cities. We want to build mines and railroads to take all the natural resources. So they got people from the country to leave their families and come into the cities to work on these projects. Right? Cities grew bigger. It's a sex trade developed because you have all these people coming in from the countryside. Perfect situation for spreading a virus introduced. If, if Africa had not been colonized, if it had been remaining small as it was in the 1800s, probably this virus would not have spread. So the cut hunter hypothesis said a hunter was hunting uh, bushmeat and got infectus. Uh, cutaneous or mucous membrane exposure uh, introduced the virus. And in the calculations, as I've said, suggest that uh, the number of people infected with the virus was probably less than 10, but only one likely spread the infection. So the entire pandemic we have today probably started with a single hunter in 1920 or so that got infected with a chimp virus. And just because of the circumstances, the way cities were growing and so forth, he spread it to many other people. This one, th these kinds of cross-species infections um, happen, probably happen all the time. You see there are already four different 
uh, crossovers into people. Only one of them really spread globally, but you know, the O, the P, and the N, not a lot of people infected. And there probably have been many, many other cross-species infections over time, starting from who knows when, because the monkeys in, in, in the woods there in Africa have been around with this virus for ages, and they probably have been spilling it over into people for a long time. So this one spread particularly because of this development of Africa, and it probably wouldn't have happened at any other time. It's, these crossovers probably still happen. You know, we blame bushmeat trade in part for Ebola outbreak. So if Ebola can cross over in bushmeat, why not SIV? But whether or not it's going to take off and whether we'd pick it up enough is an interesting question. Anyway, I've already told you this, the European colonization of Africa, establishment of large population centers, movement of males for labor, prostitution, colonial medicine. So Europeans said, not only are we going to get all the Africans to work for us, we're going to make them healthy. So they set up clinics and gave them antibiotics and various vitamins, all by injection, using unsterilized syringes. So they spread the infection that way. An, ex an example of why this is so, we don't have you know, direct evidence, but in, e in Egypt at the turn of the 20th century, the population was treated for schistosomiasis, a parasitic infection, by injection of a drug. They, used, they reused glass syringes, and what they did was infect uh, hepatitis C virus spread hepatitis C virus infection to millions of people. 70% of the population was infected with the virus because of the use of non-sterile syringes. So we think this is in part a what happened with the large-scale amplification of uh, HIV-1. <clears throat> HIV-2 is a different virus. Uh, this was first isolated a bit after HIV in Guinea-Bissau. It has 30 to 40% identity, so it's quite a bit different. It's restricted to West Africa right around this area here. Um, it's less virulent. Most of the people infected don't progress to AIDS, as we will see. It's not transmitted from mother to infant. This was a crossover from a sooty mangabe, one of those um, old world monkeys. And this has happened eight different times. So this is a very small outbreak, but yet there have been eight different uh, hu uh, monkey to human crossovers. So again, the animal human crossovers happen frequently uh, in this area. How is this virus transmitted? HIV-1, now we're going to spend the rest of the time talking about HIV-1. It's not terribly infectious. The r naught is between 2 and 5. And that's the number of people that one person uh, can infect on average. Measles is 15 to 20. So it's not very infectious. It's not spread by the respiratory route. It is not spread by fecal contamination. It's not spread by insects of any kind. No mosquito transmission. It is transmitted by sexual, sexual contact, intravenous drug use, um, blood transfusions, and mother to child at birth. So here on the left is a graph of the transmission in the United States from 81 to 2003. You can see uh, most of the transmission is in male to male sexual contact followed by intravenous drug use and heterosexual contact. It's very different in the rest of the world. The pie chart on the right, 80 to 85 percent heterosexual transmission homosexual transmission is, is very low globally. And we have intravenous drug use. Blood transfusion still happens because not everywhere is the blood supply clean. This unknown, at the time this, this chart was made, uh, what comprised part of this known, unknown, 5% was mother to child at birth. How is it transmitted? <clears throat> so this is a table showing you different human uh, fluids and the virus that's in them. So this is uh, the number of samples and how many times uh, virus has been isolated, for example, from cerebrospinal fluid, 21 out of 40 samples. So the virus is clearly there, and there's a lot of virus there as well. Uh, the main ones that are thought to be important for transmission, plasma, again, blood transfusion, accidental cuts, contaminated needles, semen, sexual activity, vaginal cervical secretions, and that's virus. On the bottom are infected cells. So here they take cells and ask, is virus present? You can see PBMCs, white blood cells. A lot of them are positive. The virus is replicating in them, of course. Uh, semen as well, and vaginal cer cervical fluid. So the question of what transmits the virus or the, s the infected cell, we really don't know. It's probably both, depending on the situation. Clearly, infected cells can transmit the virus, but Cell-free virus can 
also tr transmit infection as well. This is a study done in Uganda on couples. So these are married, uh, male, female married couples. They are discordant for HIV, means one of them has HIV and the other does not. And this is um, the probability of transmission. They were studied for a period of time. And then the uh, transmission from one to the other was, was recorded. And this is the probability per 10,000 coital acts. And what we're looking at is couples with or without genital ulcer disease. And these different uh, um, bars show you the probability of transmission depending on the viral load in the blood. So here we have less than 1,700 copies per mil, which is low, and then here greater than 38,000 copies, which is very high. You can see overall the probability of transmission goes up as you have more RNA in the blood. That makes sense, right? More virus, more likelihood to transmit infection. You can also see that if you have a very low virus load, probability is very low that you're going to transmit. So very early in infection, when your viral load is low, you're less likely to transmit. And you can also see that having genital ulcer disease substantially increases the likelihood that you will uh, transmit infection. This is not only because of open sores allow virus to get in, of course, but remember we talked a while ago in our virulence lecture about how uh, having another sexually transmitted disease, HSV2, upregulates receptors for HIV uh, in, in uh, the genital tract. So this has a combined, uh, this is caused by combined factors. <clears throat> and this is a, a summary of the risk of transmission by different routes. So here on the left we have different modes of transmission, uh, sexual, parenteral, and mother to infant. So sexual, female to male is 1 in 700 to 1 in 3,000. Male to female, pretty similar. Uh, male to male, slightly lower. But then if you go to blood products, transfusions, needle sharing, needle stick, goes way up because you're putting blood with a lot of virus in it right into you. And so that's um, a very good way to get infected. You can see some very high probabilities here. Now, if you're, if you're working in a hospital or if you get a needle stick of any kind that's known to be contaminated, you will then immediately be put on post-exposure prophylaxis called PEP. They will give you AZT initially. So if you look at the risk of transmission, if you get a needle stick and then are treated immediately with AZT, you see the probability goes way down, so, or way up the likelihood you're going to be infected is very low because if you take antiviral drugs, it will get rid of the virus, of course. It will prevent it from replicating, I should say, so you have a much better chance of surviving. Finally, mother to infant is incredibly high risk for transmission, one in four without AZT. Now, if you treat the mother just before birth with AZT to bring down the virus load, you really reduce the transmission. So that's what we do in the U.S. We have mothers come in, we give them HIV tests, and if they're positive, you get treated. So there's no reason to transmit the virus to your child. It doesn't happen in other countries. We're trying to make it happen. But obviously, this is a great way to prevent transmission to kids. It's just a matter of getting the mothers. You just give them a few doses of AZT. It brings the virus load way down. It doesn't eliminate virus, but it brings it low enough so that transmission is much lower. <clears throat> now, this virus, you might understand from what we've said, doesn't transmit well by other routes. It doesn't go through the air. Its uh, infectivity is reduced by drying in, in, a, in a day. Almost all the infectivity is gone. You can heat it and get rid of it. Bleach, alcohol, pH extremes. So it doesn't transmit well except by sexual activity or intravenous drug use. These all bypass these conditions and that's why the virus is adapted to spreading that way. <clears throat> now we talked about the fact that HIV-1 requires two receptors to get into cells. Uh, the main target are CD4 positive T lymphocytes, and the virus binds to the CD4 molecule that's present on those cells. But in addition to infect cells, the virus must bind to a chemokine receptor, either an alpha or a beta chemokine receptor, CXCR4 or uh, CCR5. We talked a little bit about this during our entry, virus entry. 
So let's go through the course of an infection with HIV and see what happens. So here's a, a diagram on the right. We have our mucosal layer in our intestinal tract, or it could be um, in an in a organ which is receiving blood uh, from an intravenous injection. But the virus crosses the mucosal barrier uh, and then infects some other type of cell. It, it can infect CD4 cells, which are just beneath the mucosal layer, or it can be taken up by dendritic cells. So on the surface of dendritic cell is a protein called DC sign. That's what it stands for. And uh, the virus will, will attach to it, but doesn't typically replicate in these cells. But what happens when DCs recognize something foreign? Where do they go? Do you remember? They go to the lymph node. That's their job, right? And what's in the lymph node? T cells, which is exactly where HIV wants to go. This is brilliant. If we can call a virus brilliant, but we can't. So the virus attaches to dendritic cells. They now have an antigen. They're going to go in the lymph node to show it to T cells. And the virus just pops off and begins to replicate. And in the lymph node, it's full of T cells. It's exactly what the virus needs. It replicates there, uh, comes out into the blood, and spreads throughout the body and replicates in any uh, CD4 positive T cell that it can find. So delivery of virus to lymph nodes, replication. You get high levels of viremia. Remember the virus in the blood from the lymph node. It spreads everywhere. And wherever there's some um, CD4 positive T cell in other lymph nodes or in other tissues, the virus will replicate. And so there are plenty of targets in just about every tissue uh, for this virus to replicate in. So when you first acquire the virus, you have a primary HIV infection. Almost half, up to 90% of those are asymptomatic. You have no idea that you've been infected. But sometimes you get symptoms like fever, fatigue, malaise, arthralgias, flu-like syndrome, right? You're getting an immune response, an innate immune response. You may have swollen lymph nodes, pharyngitis, rash, weight loss, etc., uh, and alterations in your blood chemistry. And this happens, this last, may last for about 14 days. So if you have any symptoms, it's like an acute infection, two weeks long, and then they go away and you're seemingly fine. So you would not know uh, that you had the onset of AIDS because it could be any viral infection. There's nothing really to distinguish it. This virus is spreading throughout you by the blood. In your gut, for example, there are lots, this is a, this is a, a picture of the inside of the intestine taken with a, a scope and a camera. Lining the walls of your intestine are these collections of lymphoid cells. They're called pious patches. There are tons of uh, CD4 positive lymph lymphocytes here. So this is from an uninfected individual. Here is an individual after a couple of weeks after being infected with HIV. All of these collections of lymphoid cells are gone. They've been killed by virus infection. So this is what the virus does throughout your body. It's killing all of your lymphocytes. <clears throat> so here's the overall course of infection. We've just talked about the first uh, two weeks or so where you have uh, that primary acute infection may be symptomatic or not. Um, the RNA peaks at that point. That's the acute phase. Um, and then the virus load goes down and reaches what we call a set point. So it's a low level. That level varies according to the individual, but can go on for years and years this way. So your viral load is low for 8, 10 years. Uh, during this time, CD4 positive T cells are slowly declining. So the virus is killing them. We make new CD4 positive T cells very rapidly but as soon as we make more, they're infected. So we're, we're fighting a losing battle. The virus is killing them all. Our CD4 T cells go down until some point where our immune system is shot. We can't respond to other infections. We get opportunistic infections, and that's where we uh, develop full-blown AIDS, and eventually we die of opportunistic infections. So acute replication throughout the disease. There are major reservoirs of infection. Uh, any tissue that has lots of T cells, like the gastrointestinal tract, the CNS, the genital tract, is a site of infection. You make a lot of virions each day, and they turn over very quickly. So the perfect scenario for virus evolution, making tons of viruses, and then the selection, of course, is our immune response, as you will see. Now, we have lots of sites in our bodies, as I've said, where there can be CD4-positive T cells. There are lots of these in the blood, and these are infected. Uh, they produce virus, new ones are made, and they're, they're, they're infected as well. So lots of virus production in the blood. There are also other compartments where we have 
uh, CD4 lymphocytes and their pre progenitors, the hematopoietic progenitors that give rise to these. Uh, you can see these have very long half-lives. Some of these cells last for years and then they'll divide once with the provirus in it and last another year or so. So those progenitor cells do not make virus. They just have proviral DNA in them. It's integrated, it's there forever, we can't get rid of it. That's why this is, is impossible to cure so far. We can't get rid of these latently infected cells. So I've just described to you a typical progressor where we have an acute infection, uh, clinical latency. So in all those years when you, don't, you have virus in you and it's slowly destroying your CD4 cells, you may or may not have symptoms, so we call that clinically latent and then full-blown AIDS can have rapid progressors where all of this happens in months. You progress right to AIDS within a year or two. And we also have non-progressors, all right? We have initial primary infection with or without symptoms, and then a low amount of virus for years without ever progressing to AIDS, non-progressors. So three different clinical presentations. The, one, the individuals who are infected and go years uh, without developing disease are called elite controllers. And these are people that have uh, normal CD4 levels. So you're considered to have AIDS when you have less than 200 CD4 cells per microliter. Uh, these individuals maintain normal CD4 counts and very low viral loads. It was originally thought to be undetectable but with, with increased sensitivity methods. We know now we have less than 50 copies of RNA per mil over 10 years. This is, happens at about one in 300 infected people. Uh, this, these individuals are associated with favorable MHC1 types. We talked about this before, in, in particular HLA B57 and B27, um, which can apparently recognize all the variant T cell epitopes that the virus is generating as it evolves. So if you have this kind of MHC1 haplotype, you're very good at presenting whatever the virus is evolving and having uh, the T cells recognize it and, and control the infection. You also have, <clears throat> it's not just that the virus is killing uh, CD4 positive T cells. That's not the only reason you get immunosuppressed. It's causing uh, immune cell dysfunction in virtually every other immune compartment. So the virus is killing T cells. It's replicating in them. And remember, these are helper cells. Their job is to produce cytokines to help either B cells or CTLs develop. So as you destroy them, those capabilities decline as well. CD8 cell function is impaired. The number decreases. Uh, they lose HIV activity. B cell function goes away. So you don't make good antibodies against the virus. Monocytes and dendritic cells are also destroyed slowly. Their total numbers decrease. Their ability to present antigen decreases, so you can't respond to any antigens, especially any new ones that may be coming in. This is in part why you get opportunistic infection. And NK cells uh, are also impaired as well. So it's not just the CD4 T cells that are infected by HIV, it's the, uh, all the other parts of the innate and adaptive response as well, completely destroying uh, our immune system. So this is what is defined as AIDS, uh, less than 200 CD4 positive T cells per ml. I, I misspoke, I said microliter, it's per ml. And opportunistic infections of all sorts, protozoan infections, bacterial, fungal, viral infections. And this is what originally alerted us to HIV, those four or five individuals who had pneumocystis pneumonia, which is rarely seen unless you're immunosuppressed. When, um, now, you remember when DCs, dendritic cells, detect an antigen, they get activated. They produce cytokines, they go to the lymph node, and, and the lymph node will make more cytokines. This is called immune activation. HIV prefers to replicate in an activated CD4 cell. So you have a constant state of activation in the infected individual. The virus is activating the cells, and as a consequence, the virus replicates even better in them. If you get an opportunistic infection, that pathogen will cause immune activation, which will make the virus replicate even more. In your gut, it turns out, you know, you have a, a large microbiome in your gut made of a bacteria. You get breaks in the gut 
from time to time just as part of normal life and the bacteria get inside you. Normally we can deal with that, but in an AIDS infected individual, those bacteria come in, cause immune activation and the virus replicates even more. So uh, the virus is stimulating its own replication, so to speak. You get cancers associated with uh, HIV. You might predict that because you're getting immunosuppressed. The immune system's, one of its major roles is to do surveillance to get rid of transformed cells and it can't do this, so you get all kinds of cancers, and you get neurological symptoms, meningitis, myelopathies, neuropathies, and what's called the age dementia complex. So it's a remarkable infection that in fact affects a large number of organ systems. This is really a summary of what I've just told you for your uh, use to see it in an overview. Here is our acute infection. When you first acquire a virus, you may or may not have uh, symptoms. Immediately the reservoirs are established, the infected cells that will live for a long time and produce virus from time to time. You have a long period of virus production at low levels, the symptomatic phase. You may have some of these symptoms, you may not. Um, and then you move into the final phase of the disease, the symptomatic or ACE phase, where you have very low T cells and a variety of opportunistic infections, cancers, and neurological symptoms. The neurological symptoms are a consequence of the virus getting into the central nervous system. So here on the left is a, is a blood vessel in the central nervous system, brain or spinal cord, and virus infected cells are in it, of course, and free virus particles. Uh, they can cross over into the brain proper, which is shown below. Uh, and those viruses or virus infected cells will produce cytokines. The, the virus infected cells will produce cytokines. The free viruses will infect astrocytes or oligodendrocytes or microglia, and these cells will produce uh, cytokines which in themselves have neurotoxicity. So on the bottom here are the neurons which, don't, which aren't themselves infected, but they are rendered dysfunctional by the cytokines and the products produced by infected cells. And just as an example here on the right, this is a, a microglio cell, a macrophage in the central nervous system. Uh, these can be infected by HIV. They probably don't produce new infectious particles, but the virus certainly gets in and replicates, and that stimulates the production of cytokines. And all of these are not, names around it are all the different cytokines that are produced by these cells. So you can imagine in the CNS, when these cytokines are made, this is a major component of the uh, neuroAIDS dysfunction that occurs. We also get cancers, as I've said, 40% of people with AIDS get cancers of some sort, and this is because the immune system is broken, can't do its job. Uh, you may be wondering what is making, remember we talked about how cancers arise when cells divide uncontrollably and they accumulate mutations in key proteins that then turn them into a cancer cell. Why does that happen? Well, all this immune activation is resulting in the production of cytokines. And many of the cytokines are mitogenic. They make cells divide. So we have a constant division of various cell types, B cells and T cells. So you have tumors arising as a consequence of that uncontrolled division. It's very much what like an oncogene would do, except here it's the immune system that's doing it. And you can get cancers caused by Epstein-Barr virus, uh, herpes virus 8, that's Kaposi's sarcoma, and the papillomaviruses as well. So the uh, earliest, one of the earliest symptoms of AIDS was Kaposi's sarcoma. This, was a, this is a cancer described a long time ago by a Hungarian physician named Kaposi. And um, before AIDS, it was mainly seen in old Mediterranean men who were probably immunodeficient and they were developing this cancer. But of course, in the beginning of the AIDS, it was one of the signs that the CDC said to look for to try and identify uh, infected individuals. Uh, it happens in 20% of HIV-infected people. Um, it, it can show up as a skin lesion here, but you also get internal tumors that you can't see. So Kaposi's is always associated with these skin lesions, but um, you also get internal tumors caused by it. And this is caused by having both AIDS, which immunosuppresses you, and human herpes virus 8, which is the, the virus that actually transforms the cells so that they eventually become cancerous. So can you make a vaccine against HIV? Well, when you get infected, you, you, this is a graph of viral load, which we've seen already. You do make antibodies to the virus throughout 
the infection. But the antibodies don't limit the infection. They don't, they don't eliminate infection ever. You eventually die of infection unless you're treated. And um, we do know, however, that people who get multiply infected, you know, sex workers and so forth, they, they do have some protection against multiple infections. So they don't get as infected as uh, uh, the initial infected. They don't get as many infections as you would predict if they didn't have any antibody response. So there's some suggestion that antibodies might be uh, protective. The problem is that the virus evolves in you over those 10 years that it's multiplying. Every time you make an immune response, the virus evolves to escape it. It's either an antibody response or a T cell response. Here's, it's illustrated with antibodies. You get infected with this purple uh, virus. You make uh, antibodies to it within two weeks or so, but by then the virus has already changed. And now we've got a different glycoprotein, different enough so that it's not neutralized by these antibodies. So now your body says, okay, let's make antibodies against the orange virus, and you make those, but then a blue virus emerges, and this goes on for 10 years. So you can never neutralize all the virus particles. And the graphs on the right simply show that. These are neutralization titers of, uh, say, month zero virus with month zero plasma. So uh, as soon as you dilute a little bit, the neutralization goes away. And it's not till month six that you have a good titer against month zero. But month six plasma does not neutralize month 12 virus and so forth. So it's changing as we speak. So how can you ever possibly make a vaccine if the virus is able to change so much? You would imagine that as soon as you're infected, it would immediately change to evade the antibodies that are produced. Well, here's an example of a vaccine trial. There have been dozens of these done with different vaccine candidates. They're incredibly expensive. They involve huge numbers of people. This one was done not too long ago in Thailand with 16,000 volunteers. And it used a prime boost vaccination strategy. They got a shot of um, a, a uh, vaccinia virus vector, basically canary pox version, carrying the genes for three viral proteins. And then they got a second, they got a boost with a recombinant GP120 protein, the, the glycoprotein. So first they get an infectious virus vector expressing the viral proteins, and then they get a boost with another vaccine. So prime boost, two different uh, things. They got six primes and six boost injections. It's a lot of injecting to do. And in the end, this vaccine was 30% effective. So out of these 16,000 people, in the control group, 74 got AIDS in the course of this experiment. And in the vaccine group, 51 got AIDS. So look at the number out of 16,000 people. The difference is 20. That's 30% imposed by this vaccine. So the problem, one of the problems is when you do a vaccine trial, you have to counsel people not to get infected, right? So out of 16,000 people, it works pretty well. But there are always people who get infected here about 120, and that's what you base your efficacy on. So these are not very promising trials. This is just one example I wanted to show you, but I wanted to just share with you a couple of other approaches that are very exciting and look really good. The first is that in about 20% of infected people, if you take out their B cells and isolate the genes that are responsible for antibodies and go for the ones after HIV, you can find broadly neutralizing antibodies that will, in theory, neutralize all of these HIV variants that emerge during the course of infection. And they're shown on this picture. This is the viral glycoprotein in gray, and here's the viral membrane on top. And each of these colored molecules are a, a different broadly neutralizing antibody that's been identified. So these hold a lot of promise, because apparently they recognize epitopes that don't change. So you can imagine. If you could immunize people to give rise to these antibodies, that could solve the, the variation problem. The problem with these antibodies is that they take a long time to generate. I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with the way antibodies are made, but B cells go through multiple cycles of education and selection in the, in the lymph node. And for these, it, it takes many, many cycles, and the, the, the antibody genes are extensively mutated as well. So they're, they're not easy to make. That's the bottom line. So while this sounds great, how we're going to actually induce these antibodies hasn't been sorted out yet. 
here's another uh, example that was published last year, which is pretty cool. And this is to give an animal the gene encoding the antibody. So they took one of those broadly neutralizing antibodies I just showed you, they cloned the gene and put it in a, in a virus vector. And this happens to be adeno-associated virus, single-stranded DNA virus, which is great because when you infect an animal with it, the virus stays around forever. It persistently infects you. It's not uh, pathogenic, but whatever is put into this vector will be expressed for a long period of time. So they put the gene encoding uh, the antibody, one of these broadly neutralizing anti-AIDS antibodies into this. They infect mice. We have a mouse model for AIDS. It's a humanized mice that has a human immune system that's been transplanted into it. So these mice will develop uh, AIDS, so to speak. And on the right is a graph. Let's look on the top. This is HIV RNA per mil. And this is number of challenges. So they took these mice and they infected them 21 times. You know, every few weeks they'd give them another challenge of HIV. So these are mice making this antibody. And then we're looking at viremia. And so most of these animals that, that got the vector with the antibody in it, those are the colored ones, um, they didn't make any virus after challenge. So only one early on made a little bit of virus. But look at all these other ones. Even after 21 challenges, they're resistant to infection. And the, the, the black lines are the mice that just got the vector alone without the antibody gene in it. So this was very exciting because these animals are apparently refractory to infection. On the bottom uh, is the percent of uninfected mice. So you can see as the challenges go on, the mice that just get the vector without the antibody, most of them end up being infected. But these animals who got the antibody gene are protected, 100% protected. So this is um, a very promising approach. And this is actually going into phase one clinical trial in people now to see if it will protect from infection. The, other, the last one I want to share with you is this. This is an experiment done in um, rhesus macaques, infecting them with SIV. Okay, And this is SIV. First, you give them um, a viral antigen in a cytomegalovirus vector. So the previous experiment, we're putting an antibody gene in an adeno-associated virus vector. Here, we're putting uh, a SIV gene in a cytomegalovirus vector. And again, this virus persists for a long period of time. It's one of the ones we talked about that causes persistent infections. So the monkeys produce uh, antigen for long periods of time. In this experiment, uh, we're looking at viral load again. So they're challenged with SIV, and we look at virus in the, in the uh, plasma. And all these blue animals here, uh, these got the, the vector control. They didn't get a viral antigen in the uh, CMV vector. So they uh, all got infected. And these animals down here, you can see most of them uh, were resistant to challenge. There's one uh, late one out here who apparently got infected very uh, late on. But most of these other animals, these are all individual animals, uh, were resistant. So they actually infected 99 macaques. Okay, And of course, we discussed this on my podcast. And the title was 99 macaques on the wall. Half of them are protected, and half of them are not. So we don't know why the other half was not protected with this. But again, this is undergoing more development. And this may end up being tested in people. We'll be use, using a, a human cytomegalovirus vector as well. So I think there's a lot of promise for different approaches to uh, HIV therapy that are coming up really quickly. I want to end up with um, this last slide, <clears throat> which really summarizes what I've told you. I'm just astounded by the extent of this epidemic, which started, let's say, in 1921, just to take an average year. A single cut hunter acquired SIV from a chimpanzee, patient zero. And from that individual today, we have 78 million infections and 39 million deaths.